Hi everyone, Dr. Steve Rasner here with another episode of the Lionhearted Dental Podcast. Last week I had told you that one of my listeners had uh, written to me and, and requested some information. And I came across an old blog I wrote that I thought was worthy on its own of its own podcast subject. And that's what I'm going to do this week. And the beauty of this one, which is called Phenomenal Case Acceptance, the reason your patients say yes or no. Because it's applicable if you're a D student in D3 or D4 and you're going to get out there soon. If you're an associate, wouldn't it benefit you to know as much as you could about what it takes for case acceptance? And of course, if you're the owner of a practice or even a chain of practices, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. And there's not that many things in life outside of dentistry that I am good at. But within dentistry, I'm particularly good at relating to patients who came into my office and weren't thinking probably about anything else than the chief complaint that brought them to us. So without further ado, parts of it I'm going to read to you because it's so darn good, and then I'll break away from it and elaborate. What really matters in a successful dental practice? What would infuse your practice with the most electric? The unequivocal answer is case acceptance. If you stop and think about it, how you spend your days, whether they're peaceful or frenetic, fulfilling or ungratifying, productive or another wasted day, has everything to do with case acceptance. How many patients you treat each day, how able you are to set up and contribute to a pension plan. If you have time for lunch, if you're having fun, yeah, if you're having fun, has everything to do with case acceptance. This podcast will reveal the cornerstones of getting to yes. And you can be clear, this isn't about knowing how to create snake oil sales uh, pitches, because that's not what I'm about. That is not what Lionheart Dentistry stands for. So let's start with this. The very first thing that I put in this blog that I thought was important was the communication skill of the doctor. We're not going to pull any punches here. If you can't communicate, you're toast. You're finished. Kaput. There's simply nothing more critical than your ability to talk, listen, look, add, express, laugh, be serious, and connect with your patient. Obviously, I wrote there exists a plethora of books on this subject, but I'm going to break it down for you so you can improve dramatically today on this. Before you walk into the room, you have to know the importance of what I've called for years the screen. Phenomenal case acceptance begins with you understanding this, Doc. Think about it for a minute. You only have so many hours per week to case present. You're in a room doing procedures on a patient that said yes to you. We all get yes, even sometimes, but you might not get yes to comprehensive treatment planning. So yeah, you're in your office doing dental services, but weekly, some of them translate into case presentation. If you spend that time for case presentations, randomly with people who don't share your value of comprehensive care, then everything else I have to say in this podcast will be nullified. There has to be some level of screening going on with the new patient coordinator. Now, make no bones about it. I've said this many, many times to you in different ways. But since I believe this is at the heart 
of what can make so many of you more fulfilled and gratified as a professional versus the opposite, let me say it again in this podcast. Most of your patients call your office with a specific chief complaint, don't they? A broken tooth on the lower left, a tooth that came off a partial. They're not thinking about quadrant scaling, three-quarter gold onlays, or equilibrating their occlusion. And if the new patient that calls you won't even allow, which has happened in my career, a full set of x-rays or a complete exam, then perhaps you can match them with an office with a more compatible philosophy. Because trust me on this one, whether you're listening to me right now in Japan, South America, Europe, many of your colleagues are comfortable with letting the patients dictate what type of exam you're going to give them. And I find it insulting to you, and I find it belittling to you as a colleague of mine for you to allow that. What are you? Are you a carpenter? Are you a doctor? You went to school for eight years, in most cases, to be who you are right now. And look, I'm not here telling you, and this is important because there are courses out there that will lead you this way, that you should take a comprehensive set of models, full elaborate photo photography on every patient that walks in your door, making sure that centric occlusion equals centric relation, et cetera, et cetera. No, you, you, that's not the case. But you certainly have to have a patient that, I, I can remember my career, I can remember my hygienist knocking on my private office, knowing that there was a new patient that I was going to examine in the next 30 minutes. And she would say, what do you want me to do, Dr. Rasner? They, they won't let me take a full set of x-rays. And that's what generated all these protocols over my years in practice that generated the screen. Because it's impossible for that to happen today because part of that screen is Michelle saying to the new patient, quote unquote, let me tell you how the first appointment's gonna work, Mrs. Smith. That's part of what Michelle's saying. By the way, I have all this written down. Again, all you have to do is write to me. drrasner at aol.com. And she'll say, this is how the first appointment's gonna work. Dr. Rasner is going to look, I know you called with the broken tooth on the upper right, but he's gonna look at your entire mouth and he's also going to take whatever necessary diagnostics, x-rays, maybe models he needs to make a good decision. See, that gives that patient the opportunity, the chance to say something like, well, I really don't want all that. I've had that done in the past and that's really not for me. Or I just want this one tooth treated. For real, people will occasionally counter with that. And at that point... We will briefly, we're not going to twist their arm, but we will briefly try to explain to them the, the merit of doing that and making a good decision. Because it is true. It's 100% true. How would you know what to recommend for a patient? It's one tooth if you didn't know the condition of their entire mouth. Correct? I mean, come on, guys. How many times... Have you had a patient come in and wanted, I don't know, they broke a big filling, very common new patient scenario. And in your x-ray exam, you find at least one periapical lesion. You find the, the presence of some level of periodontal disease. You know, look, I don't have to remind you, you and I chose a profession where much of the symptomology is absent from the pathology. I mean, we're not dermatologists. So, you know, you get a big rash or a mole that scares you on your face or neck and arms. The dermatologist does not have to convince you 
of what type of exam you need. Correct? But because it's really true, it's not really spoken about. You and I ended up in dentistry where a lot of the stuff that happens to patients doesn't hurt. They're not even aware of it. It becomes really your responsibility to proceed with the way I'm discussing this right now. And by the way, I forgot to counter with my first paragraph when I talked about if you don't have communication skills, you're kaput. I never followed, well, what should you do? Well, what you should do, and I don't care whether you like this or not, you have to practice. You got Every one of you has a computer. You can do a video of yourself for five minutes pretending you're talking to a new patient. You can ask me for an example of the verbiage I use. And you can edit it that fits your, your voice, or you can use it verbatim. And honestly, it just requires work and practice. And 100% of you will get better. I didn't say 100% of you will become Zig Ziglar. But you have to practice this. Listen, it becomes really easy if you're a student of dentistry. Because how many times have all of you heard the patient that comes in your office and you exercise a little bit of what I'm telling you with your new patient exam? You sit down with the patient, and I'm not going to do it right now because I'm giving you broader, broader cornerstones. But back on other podcasts, I've told you exactly, almost word for word, how I approach the new patient. And I just can't tell you how many times a patient has said to me, and I'm certain has said to you, wow, I mean, my last doctor never even turned around to look at me. He came in, he looked at the x-rays and said, well, you need this and that. And I've heard that too many times to know that it's an exaggeration. I happen to believe it is true. And I happen to believe it's true because I believe that many of our colleagues are burned out. It's not a nice thing for me to say, I think, but accurate. They are because they didn't do what you're doing. And quite honestly, it's easier today to not be burned out because you have the element of social media and things like podcast way more at your disposal than we did. And one of you listening today that doesn't have great communication skills is going to practice And you will get better. How bad do you want it? That's what I always used to ask my audience. How bad do you want it? Do you want the life that you deserve for investing the way you did to become a DMD? How bad do you want it? Because if you want it bad enough, you'll work on everything. Because no one is ever going to look back at me and write me a letter or call me and say, you were wrong. Communication is not as big of a deal as you make it, uh, Steve Rasner. No, you'll never do that. You'll, In fact, you'll tell me how wonderful your practice has become since you are now connecting with people and patients. So back, I just, I know I, did, I forgot as I'm giving you this podcast today that I didn't go back. And there are books to help you connect with people. We all don't have that level of skill equally. Some of you are just amazing at it. You don't need me to help you with that part. But it is a big part of success. Of course it is. Okay, so I talked about the screen. I've already told you why that's important. So, Because you, you only have X amount of hours in a given week, in a given days, and you don't want to waste your time like it's happened to me in my career and have somebody say, well, I don't want the whole exam. I just want the tooth yank. Literally, I've heard that. The next sub- subtitle is the first five minutes. So what's going on there? It's funny because those of you that follow me weekly know, don't you, that I just wrote, I forgot what, until I did just now, that a couple months ago I had a couple podcasts called the first five minutes. I wrote in this blog that many noted psychologists have recognized that most relationships are won or lost 
in the first five minutes. And it's absolutely true. Here's a good way to think about it. If you're a comprehensive care office, if you spend an hour or so at the initial exam, routinely do things like oral cancer screenings, a detailed analysis of their periodontium, examine even their muscles and joints, take models, note wear patterns, and of course all the other expected or common components, then you're going to diagnose more. And this costs more, significantly more. And when a consumer is asked to invest more, a lot of things become more critical that otherwise might not matter, like the first five minutes. So make sure. So what I'm saying to you right there is this. If you're going to follow a lion-hearted model of doing comprehensive exams, and if you don't do that, then you're not a lion-hearted dentist. You simply, that is not up as a bargaining chip. You, you can't skip that. For goodness sakes, you can't skip it. That doesn't mean that everybody's going to buy into absolutely every part of my exam, but you certainly can't do rushed, incomplete exams. And here's what counts. Make sure in your morning meetings, which I spoke about at the last podcast, that the front desk team anticipates the new patient arrival. It's pretty easy. If they're due at 10 o'clock, come on, start. That's what I meant last week when I talked about having an all-in staff that you can delegate to. Does your team do that? Because my team does. We know a new patient's due at 1045. Look, we don't have 30 people coming in per hour. We have a couple. So somebody comes in that we haven't recognized. They start out the relationship very, very professionally and very warm. They stand up, they walk over and say, you must be Kelly. We've been expecting you. Make yourself comfortable. Can I get you anything? Over there is refreshments. That's not really fluff. It's good old fashioned manners. And if you expect a patient to make a serious investment, perhaps that very day, by the way, which they often do with me, you better be polite and you better make them feel value for starters. You take that versus what often happens to me, which is I've walked in offices, a physician's office. You know what it's like? Handed a clipboard with a bunch of forms to fill out, treated, and I try to go to good physicians. I don't go to the, the cheap ones. I don't, they don't make me feel value. Feeling value doesn't cost money. It takes practice and time. And more than both of those, it takes a want. It takes having people at your front desk that want to do that. You better remember that when you're in the hiring process for the reception team. Let's talk a minute about your physical plan. I think it's important. It doesn't cost a lot to look Walt Disney clean, but it does require clearly defined job roles. By the way, remember guys, this is I haven't done many podcasts like this where I'm actually given a blog through a podcast so I can actually literally send you this. It's it's my podcast in writing. It's pretty good. Simply assign your staff members to do this task. It would look like this. Office fluff coordinator duties. That person would have to check the reception room several times a day. Does it look neat? Are the refreshments fresh looking? When I say that to you, you know, maybe somebody left some wrappers up there. Maybe there's one because we have several types of drinks in the refrigerator and on top of the refrigerator. We do. We spend money each week. I think we get them from uh, Office Max or something uh, of different little snacks patients can have. Are the plants alive? Are the rugs spotless? Check the restroom. Does the sink, toilet, floor, mirror, are they immaculate? Stuff a basket in the bathroom with disposable toothbrushes that have uh, toothpaste impregnated in them. Truthfully, 
You only need one person for this task, but everybody needs to care. It's like my kitchen. So we have a really nice break room for the staff. And look, I didn't always have a really nice break room. So those of you just starting out that have a four foot by five little cubby hole because that's all you have, you'll get there. Make the four by five cubby hole as nice as you can. But I assign every one of my staff members weekly to keep the kitchen looking immaculate and they hate it because every one of them says the same thing. I clean up my mess. That's not mine. Well, I listened to that for 10 years and it didn't work because you know, I ended up cleaning it up at the end of the night. You know who did it? The doctor, me. Come on, man. I got a stove, refrigerator, microwaves. It's a regular fully stocked kitchen. The price for that for my staff is one of you each week is assigned to clean it up whether you made the mess or not. And it works. It's worked for many, many years. Okay. And it's noteworthy I have wrote here in today's current post-pandemic environment that multiple, and they're all over the office, hand sanitizing stations are appropriate. And that should be part of what your reception room looks like. What about the staff? I wrote here whether you have two members or 20, they better know what you think is important. They better know that you are vigilant. And if you're going to remain a fee-for-service practice, I love this. What they do around this place matters. So what matters? So remember, I'm sitting here talking to you about case acceptance. And I've just got done talking about what the physical plant should look like. Because I, Steve Rasner, believes that that can add absolutely to yes and a positively can add to no. Positively. So about the staff. What matters, they can't be moody. They got, it has to be obvious that they love their job. They believe you, Doc, should be the president of the ADA or the USA, or whatever country that's listening to me tonight. That is how much they believe in you. Oh, I remember writing this, and I stand by that statement. That's a team that believes in you. They think you are the best dentist flat out available anywhere. They love people. They enjoy knowing patients' names. They remember stuff about everyone, a recent vacation, a retirement, the birth of a grandchild or a child. Their affection for their teammates is obvious. They care about how they look. Guys, I've had both. My most recent, I had somebody that worked for me and somehow slipped through. I mean, it happens. That's, I hope you appreciate my Patency when I tell you these stories. But somehow I hired somebody a year or so ago and this person became the poster child for everything I don't believe in. They called out a lot. They didn't look professional. They, as a female, they would come in with a sleeveless shirt on with a lot of markings that I didn't think belonged in a dental practice uncovered. I'm sorry. It's how I feel. I'm not in the business of being everybody's best buddy and anything goes, Hey, it's a beautiful world, blah, blah. I'm sorry. We're, we're dentists. I try. We're professionals. We're health professionals. And how we look matters. I'm sorry. It's just how I feel. They dress great. They smell great. They have impeccable hygiene and usually a killer smile, even if you're the one that created that doctor. They're passionate about something, anything. You get me? They're not just shuffling through. And I don't get 100% of this. And usually the people that come and go in my lifetime and career, I didn't hit all of it. I didn't hit 100%. But I, look, 
I've got 18 staff members, sometimes as many as 20. They've been with me an average of 20.2 years. I think that wouldn't happen if they didn't have most of the qualities I'm sharing with you. They walk you out of the treatment room. And they'll know what to say and what not to say. They're really hard to find. Just be patient and make sure you start looking. Because if you don't think you have them, you're going to limit your success. So, final thoughts here. It's my fervent position. Anybody listening tonight could explode their case acceptance if they were willing to implement a few cost-free protocols. You should notice that I have not mentioned to exploit your case acceptance that you need a new CBCT or your first one or even a digital scanner or a CIRAC. I don't have a CIRAC. I don't have a printer. I do have a scanner. And because you know that when you listen to me, I do a tremendous amount of surgery, so naturally I do have a cone beam. But most of the things that I've spoken about tonight come from the staff knowing what you think is important and then instilling those habits in that team delegating that to them, as I mentioned last in, in other lectures, in other podcasts, and then you being vigilant, Doc, that they're being executed because that's the hardest part in the whole process. You really never get to the place where you never have to say anything again or you never have to listen or watch. That never happens, okay? I've never said that to you before. It's just human nature because you have the most to gain and the most to lose. And not everybody performs at 100% all the time. And it's your job to motivate them with positive affirmation and the truth when it's not what you want in a proactive leadership way. And then sometimes you have to make hard decisions that this particular staff member doesn't fit. But this all leads, every part of it. You, you don't think it matters when a, when a new patient walks in your office and they look around and they see clutter, waste baskets filled with trash. I don't know. You know what I mean. And there's no order and there's nothing palpable to them that stands out that this place is different, this place is better than any place I've ever been. And that feeling carries with them from the first phone call to the day they walked in your reception room to the time they went back to your clinic for the first time. And there's this vibe that this is a team, man. I hear it every single day. And I'm hard on my staff. I am far from being Mr. Rogers. I'm not disrespectful. I don't intimidate or bully or anything like that. That's un unacceptable. But I'm clearly... They're lead, more of the leader than their buddy because it's the only way that works. I hope this will help with your case acceptance. I hope that your practice is growing, and I look forward to you reaching out to me. Stay tuned to the Lionhearted. We're going to make it happen for you.